started then? I think so. It's now six o'clock. So, Leonette, if you want to start. Well, I would like to welcome everybody to this monthly meeting of the League of Women Voters of Greater Birmingham. We have over 50 league members from throughout the state, as well as league supporters joining us tonight, which is an indicator of how important the subject of tonight's meeting is. And I'm going to let Dana introduce our guest speakers. And I just have one administrative announcement for league members. I want to draw your attention to a wonderful training opportunity on February the 24th. Professors at Auburn's Election Center will be talking with us about um, voter registration and the roles, maintenance and hygiene. And this is a rare opportunity for us to get uh, a lot of expertise. I would recommend that you sign up for that one hour training. It's from 10 to 11 on February the 24th. I will put an email address in the chat and uh, our league member from the Tennessee Valley will be taking those reservations and will give, be giving us more information later. So thank you. And I will turn it over to our vice president, Dana, to introduce the topic and the speakers for the evening. Good evening, my name is Dana Ellis. I know several people on the call and I'm so happy you're here tonight. A couple of just housekeeping details. It looks like all of you have already done it, but please try to stay on mute so we don't have any extraneous noises during our presentation. And I also always like to mention what our next meeting will be. So in March of uh, March 18th at 6 p.m., there'll be communication later but our topic will be homelessness in our community. And we'll be joined by representatives of One Roof, um, the Firehouse Shelter and Pathways. But tonight we're talking about environmental issues in Alabama. We have three panelists. I'm gonna introduce each when it is their turn. For those of you new to Zoom, and I don't know that that is anybody in this room, you can adjust your view to the speaker view so that you see the speaker only when they are talking and we are recording. Our first um, panelist is Steven Stetson. He's the sen senior campaign representative for the Sierra Club covering Alabama, Mississippi and Georgia. A native Alabamian, he spent some years in journalism and then returned to the state to, to get his law degree from, from the University of Alabama. He was admitted the, to the bar in 2017 and worked for almost a decade, I mean, sorry, 2007, and worked for almost a decade as a public policy analyst and advocate, focusing on diverse issues affecting Alabama's neediest residents. In 2017, he joined the Sierra Club, um, which is America's oldest and largest environmental organization. He served on the board of directors of many organizations um, and currently serves on the state board for the Alabama chapter of the League of Women Voters. So I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen, thanks. Hey, thank you, Dana, really appreciate it. Um, love the League of Women Voters, I'm excited. I think there's a birthday party for the League this weekend. I'm excited to check that out and be a part of that celebration. I will uh, share my screen here. I did a couple of slides and I'm gonna offer a fairly um, high level presentation about um, some clean energy issues. Let's see if that works. You're all able to see my screen okay? Thumbs up, yep, great. Uh, let's view this as a slideshow. Where would that be? Here we go. Presentation. Beautiful. So yeah, I, I not only want to talk a little bit about the clean energy work, but also just kind of what we can do and get involved. I really like the idea of talking about um, Sierra Club and some of the things we're working on. So um, many of y'all know the name of Sierra Club. It is, as, as Dana said, a big and old environmental organization. When people talk about the big greens, they are often talking about groups like NRDC, 
Earth Justice and Sierra Club. It's a classic member-driven organization founded by John Muir. I sometimes tell people, if you've ever been to Disney World and you've gone to the America Pavilion uh, in the Epcot Center, you see John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt there uh, in animatronic form. Uh, so Sierra Club has a, has a long-standing reputation, some ups and some downs and some positives and some negatives, but um, it's not as well known in Alabama as it is in California and some of the coastal cities, but we've been around in Alabama for quite some time. Um, in the 70s, Alabama and Georgia shared a chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, Alabama's chapter broke away and became its own thing, I think in the 80s. And as Dana said, I've been with the club for about four years now. And I'm employed by something called the Beyond Coal Campaign. So what you see here is a large coal burning power plant um, owned by Alabama Power uh, near Birmingham called Plant Miller. And, you know, a lot of people associate the Sierra Club with traditional conservation issues, protecting public lands, uh, hiking trails and canoeing. And we, we definitely do all those things. We're famous for our outings and getting people outdoors. Um, but around the middle of the 2000s, um, the Bush administration, the first uh, W. Bush, um, proposed building a bunch of new coal plants and people within Sierra Club as climate change was becoming a bigger issue just said no way we're not doing it. Uh, 250 or so coal plants were proposed to be built uh, favors to friends in the energy industry and volunteers uh, within Sierra Club and some other groups rose up and uh, out of that came a uh, sort of an internal campaign known as the Beyond Coal Campaign and they said we're going to block every single one of these things. And they were pretty effective. They went down the list and were checking them off. No, no, no. And as they got towards the end of the list, blocking construction of new coal plants, they said, let's go after the existing coal plants. And they started going down that list too. And that's really where uh, my part of the story picks up is basically in a very regimented and aggressive way, Sierra Club said, uh, we need to target Southern Company, which is the large utility that owns Alabama Power, it owns Georgia Power, and it owns Mississippi Power. Uh, until fairly recently, they owned another utility in the panhandle of Florida called Gulf Power. And the remaining footprint after they sold Gulf, uh, you know, Southern Company still owns a bunch of coal plants. They are still burning coal which contributes to climate change. And so we have been very regimented about a couple of things. Number one, um, trying to encourage the company to retire those coal plants, essentially to decarbonize the entire uh, electric utility sector. Uh, and I wanna be clear that that includes not just retiring those coal plants, many of which are very old and out of date and dirty. Uh, it means not replacing those coal plants with gas fired power plants as well. So that's sort of one leg of the stool is to decarbonize the electric sector. There's two other pieces to it, uh, which we have not done as much in Alabama. We also want to see um, decarbonization of the electrics of the transportation sector. So uh, we, we're big fans of electric vehicles. We want to see the fossil fuel burning cars uh, eventually come off the roads. And then there's something else in the mostly in the coast that people have been working on um, de carbonizing the building stock. You know, that includes a lot of buildings in big cities that use gas for heating. We would love to see all of that electrified. If any of y'all have a gas powered stove, like I do in my kitchen right now, um, ultimately we don't, have to, we don't have to turn those off immediately. We don't have to throw them out on the curb, but ultimately the best thing for the climate is gonna be to convert all of those things to electrified appliances and be sure that that electricity is coming from clean power sources, not a big dirty coal plant, but renewable energy sources. So we do a lot to push uh, renewables onto the grid. We do a lot in favor of solar. You know, wind is not quite as big in Alabama. It's more of a coastal uh, or uh, mid Midwest type of thing. But there, is, there are some opportunities for wind here, but really solar is, is especially where it's at in Alabama. So we've really zeroed in on one of the dirtiest and oldest and worst coal plants in Alabama Powers Fleet, which is down near Mobile. Uh, it was originally started burning coal in 1954. It's not just a single factory where they burn coal. There's actually multiple boilers that generate electricity. So they burn the coal that you know, basically creates a steam turbine that spins the turbine. And that's how the electricity comes. It's about 1200 megawatts. I'm happy to dig into the details of, 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 you know, it's a good sized power plant. Most of the ones that are left in our area are fairly large power plants. Uh, and the state of Georgia has the two of the largest in the country left burning coal. So big carbon emitters, very dirty. Um, 
basically at Plant Berry, we're really focused on getting them to retire the coal and not replace it with gas. The Alabama Public Service Commission just approved them to build a new gas turbine there. And we think maybe even another one is on the way. So um, one, the one they just approved is designed to come online in November of 2023. There's another one that may be coming down the pipe. And, you know, burning gas is also a bad climate change thing. You know, it emits methane. That's a traps heat in the atmosphere. So um, we've really focused a lot of attention on that, as well as what you see here in front of you is a very dirty liquid lake of pollution uh, where they store what is called coal ash. So any of you who've ever scraped out a fireplace after a fire, you know there's a bunch of ash in there. Well, same deal when you burn coal to make electricity. But the problem is it's not like the wood you burn in your fireplace. When you burn coal, the leftover ash is full of poison. And that poison, they basically store in a mud hole next to a river. And as you can imagine, that is not a great place to store poison. Uh, the water comes up from the bottom, leaches the heavy metals and cancer causing toxins down into the groundwater. So we've really drawn a lot of attention by um, pointing out some of the contamination that uh, these coal plants are causing to the groundwater. The water that we drink, swim, uh, fish, canoe in, uh, these are really um, toxic materials you don't wanna be around. So I'm happy to talk more about plant berry. It's something I've learned a lot about and um, we would love to see them, you know, thank plant berry for its service, give it a gold watch, but it's time to stop making electricity that way. And it's time to uh, use something like solar where the fuel is free. It comes from the sky, it's free. You don't have to dig it out of a Colombian coal mine. And um, that's the future. But unfortunately, Alabama is backwards on solar. We are taxing the sun. The Public Service Commission um, has approved uh, a fee that if you want to put a solar panel on your roof at your house, um, Alabama Power says that they can charge you extra for that, making it really difficult to pencil out the economics for residential decentralized solar systems. And in fact, to give you a sense of how much political power uh, the utility has when some groups not Sierra Club, but uh, Nina may talk about this. Her group was one of the ones that fought this battle over the solar tax. Uh, when they challenged the solar tax and said, you know, this isn't the way we ought to be doing things, Alabama Power's response was to raise the tax. So they are um, extremely prickly on the question of whether we can um, wean ourselves from the product that they manufacture. They don't like it when we would um, create our own electricity. So there's really kind of a local control democracy element to this. And we would like to see our state sort of figure this out and be a lot more like Georgia, who has been a regional leader in developing solar because they just see it from a dollars and cents angle. The electricity from solar is a lot cheaper and this is the future. This is where the jobs are gonna be. We're not building any new coal plants. The future of uh, economic development is gonna be for the states that have figured out how to capitalize on uh, the low cost of renewables. I mentioned ash and I just wanna drill into it a little bit more to highlight that this is an environmental justice issue as well. All these coal plants are built on rivers. That's what they use to cool these uh, coal boilers. And so you just have a big toxic mess. If you've ever looked at the photos after one of these coal uh, ash ponds has ruptured up in Tennessee, the mud and toxins, it's just like a cesspool. That stuff uh, spilled out into the town of Kingston there in Tennessee. And these are just ticking time bombs waiting to um, go off. We've really been pushing uh, Alabama Power and the regulatory agency here in Alabama, ADEM, to um, not allow them to leave that in place. We wanna see all of that dewatered and excavated and move to a dry lined landfill. So um, this has been a major uh, focus for us at the Beyond Coal campaign. I'll just say two, two last slides here. Not everybody in Alabama is an Alabama Power customer. We wanna acknowledge that basically the bottom two thirds of the state is Alabama Power. And the top third of the state that you see on your map there is TVA. TVA is a quasi-federal entity. It's a product out of the, uh, you know, the New Deal, out of the Depression. So um, I am not the TVA expert. So if any of y'all live up in Huntsville, I, I know a little bit about TVA. I can, I can hold my own in a conversation about TVA, but we work on those issues too. I have a counterpart who's sort of the Tennessee Valley uh, expert. Uh, they are not great either. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. I, I mentioned that Alabama Power has been very uh, resistant and committed to their fossil fuel burning. Uh, TVA has not been great either. They've been a little bit ahead on solar, but um, they still have a long ways to go. 
And my final thought here is I wanted to share a couple of thoughts about what COVID has meant. And it's just that we are also thinking about economic justice. You know, Sierra Club, you traditionally associate with people that like to go hiking and conserve the birds and what kind of owl is that? But we're also really thinking about um, the economic issues and people in the pandemic uh, have been having their power turned off. And because we have this expertise around utilities, we have really been trying to press the utilities and the entities that regulate them, the public service commissions, to place a moratorium on turning people's electricity off. You know, we had a moratorium during the early days of the pandemic. Those moratoriums have expired. So we're really trying to think about what this means in a dollars and cents type of way um, for those that can afford it the least. So not every uh, policymaker in Alabama is going to be moved by the prospects of melting ice caps or polar bears or whatever, sea level rise. You don't even have to believe in climate change to be worried about people who are paying their power bills and the fact that burning fossil fuels is driving their costs up because it's uneconomic. I think there's a real narrative there to connect an outdated view of how to make electricity with the idea that we could be saving customers money. It's a good business proposition to be building renewables. So we're uh, really talking in those terms. I said I would get to what to do about all this, and I'm almost at my 10 minutes here. So I'll just say um, you can join any organization. There are several that are working on it. We're looking for business owners. If any of y'all own a business or uh, know somebody who owns a business, we want to make this economic argument to them. We think those are the voices that Alabama Power really cares about. Uh, we would love for you to help uh, join our conversation around Plant Berry. Um, we also have been thinking a lot about people who own shares of stock in Southern Company. There's opportunities to change the company's behavior. You know, I, I'm fond of saying Southern Company is not our enemy. They are our target. We would love to change the way Alabama Power does business. So we have some ideas about that. And there's also a lot of cities that are passing resolutions saying that they want to generate 100% of the electricity in that city from renewables. So we have a whole toolkit associated with municipal strategies. I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, and then we need some structural reforms. I don't think it's news to anybody on this call that the way the Public Service Commission functions, both in terms of responsiveness and transparency in Alabama is fundamentally broken. Many of y'all may know that when you talk to somebody from another state, their eyebrows go up and they're like, wow, I didn't know it was that bad there. That's the experience I have at Sierra Club. When I talk to people, even in North Carolina or other states you know, that are Southern states, they say, wow, I didn't realize it was so bad. So there's some fundamental changes in the regulatory process that need to happen. Happy to talk more about that, but I think that's my time. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Cindy and Nina. So I'll just leave my email address here. And Dana, if you and, and, and Leonette or whoever want to circulate these slides, I, you know, you don't, you don't have to write everything down. Um, happy to um, free up some time at the end for Q&A as well. So um, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to share a little bit about Sierra Club with y'all. so much, Stephen. Um, I promise y'all a dynamic presentation. We're off to a great start. Let me introduce next Cindy Lowry. Cindy is the executive director of the Alabama Rivers Alliance. She's been with that group since 2005 and was promoted to executive director in 2007. Also a native Alabamian, she was born and raised in Aniana got her bachelor's from Auburn and her master's of public administration from UAB. The focus of her master's thesis was citizens participation in public policy, which I think speaks to everybody on this call. She has 15, more than 15 years of experience in the conservation nonprofit sector. Um, she was awarded, I found this interesting, or by awarded the Auburn University Alumni Spirit of Sustainability Award in 2017 and has been inducted into UAB's MPA Hall of Fame. Wow. She's a former board member of Alabama Arise and the Friends of Locust Fork and a current board member of the League of Women Voters of Greater Birmingham. So y'all help me welcome Cindy. Thank you so much, Dana. It's so great to be here. Um, it's great to be a new board member, fairly new still. I feel board member of the League of Women Voters of Greater Birmingham and um, great to be with you guys tonight and hard to follow Stephen, but I will do my best. And we're gonna talk a little bit about water, but I think my presentation, it's gonna follow on um, quite well with, with what Stephen was talking about. So I will share my slides. Let 
works. Can you guys see that? All right, so the Alabama Rivers Alliance um, is not as old as Sierra Club, but we're going on about 24 now. And we have, uh, we were formed by grassroots folks who were forming um, volunteer groups that were friends of their creek. Um, the Cahaba River Society was around before us and they were all looking for kind of a statewide collective um, uh, voice at the state level for, for rivers. And they formed the Alabama Rivers Alliance. Our mission is, um, is we're a network. So we, we think of ourselves not necessarily an umbrella. There's not a, a real formal um, membership. We do have an organizational membership, but really anybody that wants to work with us and or wants us to work with them um, is part of our network. And um, we, we really focus on connecting, convening, building partnerships and um, advocating at the state level for sound water policy and its enforcement. We have members all over the state, um, network uh, groups all over the state, Sierra Club and GAS for both great partners. And we work on a lot of issues uh, that uh, some of the stuff Stephen mentioned that we're, we're partner with them on coal ash. Um, and, and there's just a gazillion issues dealing with water quality, the, the health and safety of what's in our water, the pollution in our water and how it gets in there and how to deal with that. But tonight I'm gonna talk to you about something that we think a little bit less about in this state, which is water quantity. Um, the water that we used to drink and the water that we have in our rivers and streams and how we are not managing that um, at the state level very well. Alabama is a river state, um, so I'd like to show the, the seal. We're actually the only state seal in the, in, the st in the country that has rivers in its seal. So it really showed that our founding um, members of our state really cared about water. Um, maybe that was for economic reasons or just because they liked um, playing on them, but that's what they put in there. So we have, a, we have a really special state when it comes to our rivers and streams. We are number one in freshwater biodiversity in the entire nation. Um, so we have more fish, more crayfish, more uh, snails, turtles, and mussels than any other state in the entire country. We have 10% of the freshwater resources that flow through our state. Um, so we have a lot to be thankful for and a lot to protect. But critters are not the only thing that rely on our water for our lives and our economy. And um, Stephen was talking a lot about energy. So I want to focus you on this pie chart um, in the top left corner and at least my left. Um, <laughs> the, the largest part of our water withdrawals in the state of Alabama are 88% there is for industrial thermoelectric and mining. And 83% of that is that big word thermoelectric. And what that is, is the water it takes to cool those coal burning and nuclear burning power plants. It takes billions of water a day to make that work. Um, it withdrawn, now that's withdrawn, it's not all consumed. Um, some of it's put back in, but even, even with the what's put back in, it's still by far the largest um, use of our water. So many states that chart is different. That little tiny green sliver um, says agriculture. Our farmers do not irrigate much in Alabama historically. So um, and you go up to the Midwest, that pie chart, the green slice is gonna be the biggest slice, but here it's our electricity that's using the most of our water. Public water supply and residential is the red piece, um, a very important uh, piece of it, but not, not a huge uh, piece of, of the use of water withdrawals in the state. So we also use our water, and, you know, in addition to drinking and electricity, we use it for recreation and recreation is not just for fun. Recreation is a great economic engine in the state. This other, um, tiny print slide over here, our picture is, <laughs> you can't read it, but it says 55% of Alabama residents participate in outdoor recreation. Um, more residents in Alabama participate in fishing than the average American. Um, and more than twice the number of jobs in Alabama depend on outdoor recreation than um, in auto manufacture, on auto manufacturing. So it is an economic engine for our state and it's growing. I imagine these numbers are pre-pandemic and with all the outdoor recreation that's happened during the pandemic, I imagine that's even stronger. We also have a large number of subsistence fishermen, uh, fishers in the state that people who rely on the fish that they catch for food and, and to feed their families. So water is a very important aspect. We need to have it not only for our use, but we need to have it in our rivers and streams so that they can, the nature can continue to do its thing and supply us what we need. So why, why, do, why should we care? Um, we have so much water, as I mentioned before, why should, why should we worry about it? Well, there are a lot of threats to our water supplies in Alabama and they are increasing um, and they're increasing for many reasons. If you look, we have um, most of our major river basins are shared with 
other states and upstream other states. So Georgia and Alabama and Florida have been fighting over the Chattahoochee River for decades. Um, the Alabama Coosa Tallapoosa rivers, which are the heart of our, our river systems in our state, um, start in Georgia. And Georgia's decided to dam up all these rivers and keep some of the water, more of the water up there for, for Atlanta and, and other uses they have. And so we have to fight them. And right now it's it's a, the fight, where, where that fight happens is in court and also in um, comments with the Army Corps of Engineers. There, there are currently also fights going on with Mississippi and Tennessee over groundwater. So water conflicts with other states are not decreasing, they are increasing in the Southeast. And um, these battles are going to continue as water supplies get more challenged from things like drought. Um, December 2016 is this, this um, state, state slide here. It is a, the last time we had a really, really bad drought. You may recall um, if you're in Birmingham, which I guess most of you probably are, this, uh, the, the Birmingham water supply that we're all familiar with, Lake Purdy, went completely dry. And um, we have over 500 water utilities in the state. So that are supplying water to people, 530 something, I think. And each one of those water utilities in times of drought has to decide how they're going to handle that. They have to, they, they decide individually, independently on, for themselves, how they're going to deal with that water shortage. Um, so we'll, we'll get a little more into that state, lack of state oversight in a minute. And, and if you look at the, another sort of impending threat that's not quite here yet, I mentioned irrigation. Farmers are starting to recognize that as rain patterns are becoming less predictable, um, they can grow, grow much more reliable yields if they irrigate. So the irrigation is increasing. Our state legislature has uh, in recent years passed um, in tax credits for farmers who wanna put in irrigation systems. And if you look at this United States map here, the West is consistently under major drought. And while that's why we have the wildfires and this, this is becoming just pretty much an every year thing for the West. Where do we grow most of our food in the US? A lot of our vegetables, California and out West and in the Midwest. As those states become less out or less um, hospitable for agriculture, it's moving East and hence irrigation is moving East. So our farmers um, not only wanna irrigate more but they see great opportunities for um, more agriculture in the state. And that's going to be a huge new demand as we move forward. What about climate change? Um, also, uh, a big threat to our water resources. Sometimes we don't think about climate change and, and how it's infecting our, but we do know that climate change is bringing more storms and it's bringing changes in storms. So the New York Times article um, is just kind of lending a little credibility to the argument that while we don't know exactly what impact, whether global warming is impacting the number of hurricanes, although we had the most hurricanes we've ever had last year, um, we do know that it's changing the way the storms behave. And by, and by that, they mean they're holding more water, they're dumping more water all in one place, they're causing floods, they're causing um, major destruction. And um, as you can see from these other headlines last year, the city of Marion um, was without drinkable water after hurricane data. The uh, county, Mobile County was dealing with sewage overflows. So our storms are impacting um, our waterways as well. And then there's a little thing called the pandemic. <laughs> and it did not escape the water sector either. Um, uh, Stephen mentioned utility, um, utility bills being uh, cut off. Well, water was the same. Water and water utilities are not investor owned like Alabama Power. So water utilities actually need their um, income from their their rates to um, from your bills to, to pay for their operations to, to treat the water and get it um, cleanly to you or to treat your wastewater and get it clean back back into the river so it's really detrimental to them when they don't cut off when they don't do shutoffs or when they rack up bills that they, that are not paid but it's also detrimental to um, residents particularly low-income residents when they have these high bills or when their water gets cut off in a pandemic Again, 530 something water utilities had to figure out what to do on their own. And they were not included in any of the, the relief that was from the stimulus or the PPP or any of that. None of that was eligible for water utilities. So they're still struggling to figure out how to deal with this. And, and customers are still struggling to figure out how to pay those bills. So we need an Alabama water plan. What does that mean? Um, we need a plan that will protect stream flows. We need a plan that will do all these things and all these bullets. Um, create state level oversight. There is no regulation of water use and water withdrawals in this state. Um, there's regulation of water quality, but not water quantity. There's some voluntary measures um, and some data gathering, but that's about it. 
And as we, we want to move toward cleaner energy sources, as, as Stephen mentioned, clean energy has many benefits. And one of those is it uses a lot less water. Um, develop strategies for sharing water equitably and resolving conflict. We want the plan to ensure that water is affordable and um, accessible by all. We, want it, we don't want to have to sue our upstream neighbors because nobody can afford to do that. <laughs> we want to make we want to have plans in place for for when there's conflict or when there's shortages um, we want to invest in adequate infrastructure the federal government thankfully is really paying attention to water infrastructure and, and hopefully that's going to improve um, and of course we're going to have to identify what laws need to be passed at the state level to do this there are no comprehensive federal laws around water quantity either so we don't have a clean water act version of water quantity laws so that's why states are kind of left to deal with this on their own there has been progress made. Um, every time we have a major drought, the government does something. <laughs> so in the 90s, there was a, a go governor, um, um, Spiegelman, had a, had a study and we made a, we moved a little bit forward in the 90s, had, had an agency form that kind of looked at this, doesn't do much, but looked at it. Um, uh oh, this is recorded, I shouldn't say that. Let's just say they haven't completed a water plan yet. Um, <laughs> There's also in the two, earlier 2000s, there um, in 2008, when there was a major drought, the state legislature formed a permanent joint legislative committee on water policy and management. They met and studied some things and, and looked at some things for a little while. Um, and then in, in 2012, Governor Bentley um, took some leadership on this and directed state agencies to make some recommendations. There was some progress made there. Um, also after a drought. And then in recent years, it's been raining and Governor Ivey um, has different priorities and has not taken um, an interest in this. So it's kind of stalled again. But each time it makes a little progress, moves a little bit forward. So we just need to keep building on that. Um, what you can do is, um, the most important thing you can do is talk to your elected officials about this. They, um, it's gonna have to be leadership at the legislative level and at the governor level. So we need to think about water when we vote and we need to be talking about what water quantity as well as water quality because they both go together. If you don't have enough water in the stream, you're not gonna be able to dilute the pollution. Um, you're just gonna be more expensive to treat it so we can drink it. Um, and more that makes it um, you know, harder to treat and more expensive for, um, and that makes you know, deal with equity issues. And then um, we need to be aware of the water we use. Just learn more about it. Where's your drinking water come from? What are the threats there? Get more engaged with your water utility. Get involved with local river groups, of course. Um, that you know, we 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 recognize that the statewide voice is only as good as the strength of the local groups and the local champions that are out there. So we want you to get involved first at your local level, and then and then get involved with us. Um, and you know, join the Rivers Alliance. So there's some other ways you can be engaged just to learn more. Um, we have a weekly Zoom on Tuesdays. Um, every week, you can sign up on our website to register for those. Just a variety of topics and speakers. I'm um, Stephen and Sierra Club. We're going to be there on next Tuesday. Um, we have a documentary film program. If you go to southernexposurefilms.org, you can uh, check out some of those. We, we make four films every summer with, with film fellows um, on some of these issues we're talking about. And we have an annual conference called Alabama Water Rally that'll be coming up virtually in April. Um, and that'll be announced pretty soon. So you, you'll be able to see that on our website. And that's my spiel. We would love for you to help us get a water plan. Let me how to unshare my slide here. Stop share. There we go. And let me remember to unmute. Thank you, Cindy. That was fabulous. So we're going to continue on our role of wonderful speakers and Nina Morgan is an organizer and a music fanatic, according to what she told me, based in Birmingham, Alabama, where she works as a climate and environmental justice organizer with the Greater Birmingham Alliance to Stop Pollution, a group that a lot of us know as GASP. She's a graduate of UAB, where she studied anthropology and sociology. As a Black, Southern woman, working class person, Nina is committed to working to create a world in which people and planet are cherished, protected, and liberated. So Nita, it's on you now. Thank you for joining us. All right, um, thank you all for having me. I um, also have slides and uh, I'm gonna try to bring us home here. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, we will get started. So um, 
Let's see. Yeah. Hey, y'all. Um, my name is Nina Morgan, and I'm a, a climate and environmental justice organizer for GASP. Um, I have been with the organization for about um, a year and a half. I'm the youngest person there. And, um, you know, it's it's been wonderful um, just getting the experience of, um, you know, learning more about gas, the day-to-day -day operations and, and doing the work. Um, gas was a small nonprofit and we have um, three other uh, staff members, Michael Hansen, our executive director, Haley Lewis, our staff attorney, and Kirsten Bryant, our deputy director of outreach. Um, we, so uh, our vision is a, a healthy, just, and sustainable Alabama. Um, and our mission is to advance healthy air and environmental justice in the greater Birmingham region through education, advocacy, and collaboration. Um, and so, yeah, GASP isn't quite as old as uh, neither the Sierra Club or the um, Alabama Rivers Alliance. We actually just had our 10 year anniversary in 2020. We've been around roughly since like 2009, 2010, um, you know, and we started as a health advocacy organization called Alabama First. And the subsequent year in 2010, um, you know, we changed our name to honor a student led group that um, did a lot of groundwork in the 1970s that called themselves the Greater Birmingham Alliance to Stop um, Pollution. And so that, you know, that's our namesake and it inspires us to be a voice for um, everyone's right to breathe clean and healthy air regardless of zip code. So. Um, we categorize our work into like four different buckets. Um, we first, the first bucket is healthy air. So again, we advocate for clean and healthy air regardless of zip code. Um, we do a lot of, you know, community science work, um, legal work, um, and, and organizing work to do this. We also focus on climate and energy policy. Um, you know, and, and environmental justice, um, working with communities, uh, particularly folks who are on the front lines of, um, you know, uh, air pollution um, and the extractive industries that, you know, Cindy and, and Stephen both, both, both talked about. Um, and then lastly, uh, our, our bucket of work is storytelling. So we try to help um, amplify the issues on the ground, amplify our work and amplify the stories and experiences of people who are dealing with, um, you know, air pollution issues and environmental injustice issues every single day. So, so yeah, that's a little bit about what we do. And, and what I wanted to talk about today um, is North Birmingham. So again, I'm a climate and environmental justice organizer and my, the biggest responsibility is to, is to work with community, um, build relationships and um, work to build people power to uh, convince people that they are not the, the isolated uh, potted plants that they think they are and that actually working together um, and building a united front, uh, people can you know, do amazing things and really call truth to power and hold um, elected officials and industries, polluting industries accountable for the impact that they're, they're having, the negative impacts that they're having in, um, in, in the community. And so um, I like to preface uh, talking about issues of North Birmingham by really lifting up the mark that it's made, um, not just in the greater Birmingham area, but in the world. Um, if, you're, if you are seeing my slide, there's um, a plaque uh, on the right-hand side in Collegeville. It's right on the Collegeville Bridge. And um, it says, you can't really see it here, but it says, you know, um, that col it's Collegeville, Alabama, uh, the cradle of the civil rights movement. And that's, that's very true. You know, you had civil rights movement leaders like Fred Shuttlesworth um, from co the Collegeville neighborhood. Um, and, and you had people uh, like Dr. Martin Luther King um, Jr. Who, who organized in the community, who held many a meetings in people's homes. Um, you have the historic Bethel Baptist Church in North Birmingham, um, where people come every year from all over the world for tours and to learn about um, the legacy of the civil rights uh, movement and the history of the area. Um, and you have historic structures that, you know, are considered blight, but they're actually, you know, just, just um, 
pieces of, of the legacy of the community, um, like this, this old city hall um, in, in, in downtown North Birmingham that's kind of wedged up against a bridge, um, which you know is kind of like a, a example of urban renewal and the way that bridges uh, have cut through communities. And so I like to start there um, because you know, in the midst of a community that's dealing with so many different problems, um, you have foot soldiers that still live there. And um, it's a it, it, I think it's a call for, for Birmingham and the world to reckon with how uh, these small places and, 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 and um, it, you know, it, places that ignite movement to this day are still dealing with the very issues that, that they tried to call out you know, way back when. So, so yeah, I just, I just like to say that. Um, but of course, North Birmingham is kind of a textbook case of structural um, and environmental racism. So, um, so Birmingham, you know, is pretty, pretty unique in that uh, it, it, it developed because um, of, of natural resources like coal, um, limestone and iron ore, which, which, which are used to, to smell, um, to smell iron. And, and, um, and so, you know, Birmingham kind of like emerged as a magic city because of the industrial um, development that happened. Um, but, but it's, you know, a lot of development is happened within the context of the Jim Crow South. And this is a image of a redlining map um, a part of the North Birmingham community. And the, um, the area that's kind of circled at the top here is, is uh, the North Birmingham 35th Avenue site that's comprised of three neighborhoods, um, Fairmont, Harriman Park, and Collegeville. And so, um, so yeah, this is, it's just this legacy of um, environmental racism that's playing out to this day. Um, and this, this is kind of the EPA boundary of the 35th Avenue site. Um, you know, the north kind of west corner is Fairmont. Um, the, the northeast corner is, is Harriman Park. And then below, um, kind of underneath the Bluestone Coke, that black strip that, that is the Bluestone Coke um, plant is Collegeville. Um, some, some essential uh, characteristics of the Superfund site, again, it's three neighborhoods. Um, the it's, so people are dealing with e elevated levels of air toxics, um, you know, which are kind of cancer causing um, pollutants in the air and soot, uh, PM 2.5, um, benzene, um, so on and so forth. Bluestone Coke, which used to be ERP Coke, which used to be Walter Coke. Um, and Nucor Steel are actually uh, two of two major sources of air pollution in the area, but there's also minor um, sources of air pollution like uh, metal recycling plants, um, foundry, so on and so forth that, that are um, in operation as well. So the cumulative impact of all of that is, is something that's very worrisome. Um, there has been no comprehensive health assessment in, in the 35th Avenue site. Um, though, you know, people time and time again will tell you about the ways that the exposure to toxic air has impacted their health um, and the long term cleanup um, through the national priorities listing that was originally recommended back in 2014 was thwarted by um, the 2014 corruption scandal that I won't, won't go into too deeply today, but just because of time, but um, it's, it's definitely a part of the story. Um, so talking about impact too, I, I want to highlight energy insecurity in Birmingham. So um, because it's, it's something that as an organizer, I see um, kind of uh, colliding with this issue of air pollution. Uh, so the, um, the, the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy released a report back in 2016 that kind of talked about uh, what Stephen mentioned, which is this, this issue of uh, energy burden. Or um, there's, there's another uh, amazing researcher called, her name is um, Dr. Uh, Diana Hernandez, and she wrote a paper on energy insecurity, which kind of expands on the concept of energy burden and talks about like the physical aspects, the social aspects, the behavioral aspects of energy insecurity, um, which I'll drop in the chat later 
one, I encourage everybody to read that paper because it really goes deep into thinking about energy insecurity, which is what I choose to, choose to kind of call it. But out of 48 cities that were assessed in the report, Birmingham was listed as ha having the highest um, citywide energy burden, which means that people are disproportionately spending their income on utility bills. Um, and for low income households in particular, you know, 10.9% or more of their income are going towards, um, towards paying their utility bills, which is really significant when you think about the fact that, you know, most low income people in Birmingham make around like 30,000 you know, $30,000, $35,000 of that um, or less, you know, especially for people on fixed incomes. So if you're spending, if you're making that much money a year and you're spending like, you know, 10.9% or more of your of your money on, on, on energy, um, your utility bills and stuff, that means that you're having to make really hard decisions about um, whether you, you know, spend your money on your utility bills or whether you uh, pay for your medicine or pay, pay for your food or daycare or what, what have you. And so since the highest energy burden quartile in the report, I'm going to kind of going to get a little bit nerdy, but since the highest energy burden quartile was 18.8%, that means that 25% of low income folks in Birmingham are, um, are, are, spend, are, are spending 18.8% or more of their, um, of their income on their utility bills. And um, that's in the, in, and that's, it's really significant. I'll drop this, this report in the, in the chat too, if somebody hasn't already. And it really illuminates um, the need for energy efficiency interventions in places like um, Birmingham, especially North Birmingham, where if you look at kind of their census tract information and their and their like kind of isolate that energy burden of the particular area, people are people are spending a significant amount of their money on utility bills. And, and as an organizer, just being just going into people's homes and seeing their their um, conditions, a lot of people are dealing with extreme heat or extreme cold or, you know, living in houses that are very, very old. And, um, and, and in need of some weatherization. Um, so, so yeah, that's an that's impact that, that in addition to air pollution and all that goes with that people are, people are having to deal with. Um, I wanna say that all of it's connected to climate change in, in a way uh, we know that extractive fossil fuel based industries contribute to um, climate change and the, the externalities of those industries, the impact of, of those industries um, affect, you know, basically the most extreme hazards um, are, are, are um, having, having to go to the most vulnerable communities, which is completely um, and utterly unfair. And, and we, I don't wanna live in a world where, uh, you know, I turn on the lights and the impacts of that process is, uh, is, is, is impacting some of the most underserved and, and vulnerable um, uh, members of, of our community. So, so we should work to fix that. Um, and so in order for gas, in order for our vision of a healthy, um, you know, and, and, and just uh, and sustainable Alabama to come to pass, we must address um, the climate crisis and advocate for um, clean and renewable energy. Um, just to talk a little bit more about impacts um, in North Birmingham, uh, President Biden mentioned this, um, you know, in one of his speeches in January during the inauguration. But folks who are um, are dealing with like 24/7 air pollution are more likely to die from COVID. Um, that's research that's coming out of Harvard and in many other places, and it's it's kind of um, cycling time and time again. And um, and and I I hear that you know I, I talk to a lot of folks who have relatives who have died from the virus um, and who continue to get sick um, and and passed away. You know, there's funerals in North Birmingham and the 35th Avenue site in particular every single weekend. Um, and so, so it's, it, they're kind of people who live in frontline communities are at the nexus of all of these different kinds of issues. One question that um, Charlie Powell, who's the president 
of uh, PANIC, which stands for People Against Neighborhood Industrial Contamination, asks time and time again, especially to elected officials, is, is would you live here? You know, would you live in a community where, uh, in, like, like you see in one of these pictures in, in the presentation, your house is right across the street from a coke plant? Would you live in a community um, where flood, extreme flooding happens because you live in a floodplain and also the infrastructure in this part of the city is um is is crumbling um and these two pictures that's at the top here uh illuminate that um the mayor in 2019 mayor whitman um had a meeting with um uh, the deputy um uh, uh, assistant administrator of the epa stephen cook uh, who came to birmingham because mr powell uh you know you know invited him um, gave kind of a presentation on the issues of North Birmingham and, and you know, what the city plans to do. And, and right behind him, um, I don't know if y'all can see his podium, but right behind him, there was like these billows of smoke um, just, just coming up. And I think that just, I don't know, that this image kind of, um, kind of points a finger at the elephant in the room, which is that like, it's just not okay for people to be living across the street from these industries. And it's also not, not okay really to have industries that emit this kind of toxic um, pollution. Uh, we, we, we have the technologies now and they're becoming better um, for clean, clean renewable um, sources of energy. And it's, it's beyond time to make that shift. Um, and, and then in addition, you have, you have the energy burden, you have the energy insecurity uh, problems that plague North Birmingham and, and really the whole city and, and other parts of this country. Um, and then I have some slides about how gas is taking action. We're taking action through um, national collaborations with um, networks like the, the US Climate Action Network. Um, you know, we're taking action regionally um, with uh, the Gulf South for a Green New Deal um, coalition and the Southeastern Climate and Environmental Network. Um, we're taking action locally because um, we know as a small organization, we have to work together in order to change anything. Um, and I think that's something that Cindy and Stephen pointed out to as well. So we, we throw down with the Birmingham Earth Coalition, the North Birmingham community has monthly meetings to talk about these problems and ways to address them. And that's the, the North Birmingham community listening sessions that I've been working to organize um, so, and so on and so forth. Um, one cool thing that we started doing um, in the midst of COVID is organized pop-up markets um, where we work to distribute fresh produce and we partner with Jones Valley Teaching Farm to do this and also PPE like face masks, hand sanitizer, cleaning products, um, and so on and so forth. And I, I didn't talk about this either, but North Birmingham is a food desert and there's only one grocery store. Um, and it's not, it's not um, you know, in walking distance of the 35th Avenue site. And so food insecurity is also a really big problem um, in the community. Um, and in addition, we, we uh, do a lot of air quality monitoring. Um, we are our regulatory watchdog, and so we make uh, comments on uh, Title V permits and the ambient air um, monitoring plans, and we participated in different legal interventions. Um, and how can you help? Um, if you live in the greater Birmingham area, you can always become a member of GASP. The membership allows us to pursue legal actions on um, the behalf of our members. Um, and we have made membership free uh, in, the, in the midst of the COVID pandemic. Um, of course, you can still, you know, pay your membership dues for as little as three dollars. Um, you can help tell the story. You can help amplify these problems that are happening. Just share share the problems on social media. Follow follow us on social media on on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and also, you know, talk to your neighbors and talk to your elected officials about this. We we shouldn't want to live in a world where people. Um, you know, are, are dealing with this kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and, and frankly speaking, we're all gonna feel the, if you're not feeling it now, you will um, feel, feel the impacts of climate change. We can't continue, um, you know, in, in the trend that we've been going in without everybody feeling, feeling pressure. Um, and you can also volunteer. We're really open. Um, you can, if you would like to come to our pop-up markets and get to know people in the community and um, other volunteers, you're more than welcome. 
Um, you can help us with research and help us with our community science efforts. And then here's just some information about how to contact us. Um, happy to share these slides. And, um, and that's, that's it for what I have to share. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much, Nina. I know, um, are y'all still doing your pop-up markets right now? Or are you waiting till better weather? Yeah, so our last pop-up market that we did was in November. And then uh, we had like a, a, a big turkey giveaway in December, but we're gonna start um, for 2021 um, on March 20th. And that will be in, um, in North Birmingham in, in Collegeville. And then the next one will be in Fairmont. Um, thank you for that information. And I'm, we, if you will share your slides with us, we can get them out to everybody on this call. But if you also want to put an email address in the chat box for people that can't wait to, to reach out to any of the three of you to help, please do that. Um, looking at the chat box, um, Leonette did mention that the league partnered with GAS to, um, to do voter education material at, at one of the pop-ups. I think just one, maybe more. Um, and, and so we've worked together. Um, Stephen, you're talking about energy burden. Do you wanna to speak to the whole group about that? I thought Nina did a great job. I was just offering a clarification of the uh, of the term in case anybody was new to that terminology. I will tell you that when I, we first started talking to Southern Company, the two terms they had never really heard was energy burden, and they had also never heard of what we would call a just transition. And that by that term, I mean you know we are advocating for these fossil fired fuel fossil fuel plants to close down. Um, but we want there to be a just transition. We don't want to see a padlock put on the gate overnight. We know that human beings work there. Those paychecks are often the highest wages in those communities. So we want to, you know, have a sensible workforce training program for those people so that we can transition away from it. And I will tell you that although they haven't figured it all out, they did in their next subsequent report, Southern Company has begun talking about energy burden and just transition for those communities. So I would say that we should be encouraged that if we start using that kind of language and push the right stakeholders, um, we can change the way they talk about their own business. Uh, Nina, you mentioned health assessments that GAS does in North Birmingham. Can you elaborate just a little bit on that? Yeah, I, I actually um, said that that no health, no comprehensive health assessment has happened um, in throughout the this whole time. Okay. Yeah, throughout, throughout this whole time, even though you know um, uh, different folks who live in the community have have asked, um, you know that have have asked for that, um, and, but we it's not it's not kind of not in our um, kind of scope of work to do health assessments. However, we are doing a community needs assessment this spring. Um, it, this is kind of connected to our mutual aid work to better understand what are kind of like the day-to-day -day material needs of the community um, and how can we uh, use the, re the results and yeah, the results of that survey to um, bring in other um, partners to, to help with that work. Is that another area where you could use volunteers in yeah. the community assessment? Okay, great. A lot of the comments that I am seeing in the chat box are, are great comments, but they aren't specifically questions. So please do read those. But I wanted to invite anyone in the meeting tonight who does have a question for one of all of the panelists to unmute and ask that question or make that comment. Hey, uh, this is Scott Rezek. Can you guys hear me okay? Give we a nod. Can. Okay, we great. Can. Thank you, Dana. Uh, I had a question for Cindy. I just wanted a, a little bit, um, maybe a sentence or two, clear, or not since clarification, but a, uh, her slide, a picture of it. I know you're going to put the, get the slides out, but 88% of the water intake in the entire state of Alabama is used. Um, in the mining industry and, you know, overall industrial. I just wanted to 
dive into that slightly more because that was a, a startling a startling stat, I think, on that slide when I yeah, saw so that. The, office, the Alabama Office of Water Resources, every five years, um, put, is supposed to put out a report. They, they uh, partner with the U.S. Geologic Survey, and they it's a water use in Alabama report. And the every, um, every five years, it's five years old. So the data that comes out, that came out in 2020 is from 2015. Um, actually, the graph I showed was from the 2010 one, but it didn't really change much um, in the latest one. So 83% of the water withdrawals in the state, and again, like I said, there, there's some nuance there because it, it, some of that water gets put back in, but 83% alone is for the thermo thermoelectric cooling of coal and nuclear power plants. And then um, to make up that 88, they throw in industrial and mining there um, but really most of that is the cooling of the power plants. There's huge intakes that suck huge amounts of water to cool those towers that then make the theme. And I don't know how all the electricity process works, but it does, fossil fuels, particularly coal and nuclear, use huge amounts of water um, in order to, to make it, to make electricity. Um, and that's why they're all located on these giant river systems, the biggest river systems that we have. They're right on the edge of rivers because they have to have all that water available to take in um, to make the process work. So yeah, um, I can put a link to um, that, that information on the Office of Water Resources website. So you can, there's, they've actually done surface water assessments that are really a lot more um, comprehensive of all the different uses. Um, but, but yeah, agriculture is surprisingly not a very large use and energy production is what's using most of the water or withdrawing most of the water. Yeah, and, and so the, that little red sliver, I mean, that's, you and me and every single one of us that run our uh, showers and dishwashers every day, that's that red sliver. Right, and, and also public water supply. So if, if uh, um, like a, so it's for residents, but also some, some businesses run off of, if they're buying their water from Birmingham Water Works, that's counted in that slide. Got it, if, okay. It, the industry and mining and thermoelectric are all pulling directly from the river. Right, and then the eight, and the thank you for the clarification. You, you did it because it was the eighty three percent. Because I remember when you were speaking, you said that, but I was looking at the eighty eight percent of the slide. But I think the takeaway here is that the the mining and the electrical um, companies in this state are you're using up eighty three percent, and yeah, that that's a startling stat. Thank you. Correct. Right. I'll put the water resources link in the chat, um, and you're you're welcome to email me as well to to get more details, but. This is just their the agency's whole page, but they're really their whole existence is to monitor. It. Well, it's not really it's not regulatory. It's really to to just report the data on, and that's only if they're voluntarily choosing to to report to the water resources. So since it's not a really uh, regulatory program, there's no permitting for water withdrawals. That that water that Alvin Power or in TVA take out of those rivers is theirs. They don't have to pay for it. They don't have to get a permit for it. They do have to account for the quality of the water that they put back into the rivers. They, they have a permit for that, that water quality aspect for the Clean Water Act, but they don't have to get a permit to withdraw. They just have to say, we're withdrawing this and it's a beneficial use um, to the public. Thanks, Cindy. There's two more questions in the chat box. Beverly um, was wondering, Nina, is the community listening group open to the public? And if so, how can people participate? Um, it's not really, it's it's meant to be more of a space for residents of the North Birmingham 35th Avenue um, site. Although uh, other frontline communities are starting to like uh, self-organize. So there's amazing people in Fairfield that are getting together and they join the call, but it's, it's more meant for like people who are living on the front lines, like across from industry. Mm -hmm. um, that said, we welcome speakers. And um, Beverly, uh, I would encourage you if you would like to kind of um, get more intimately involved in efforts to um, stand in solidarity with, uh, with, with North Birmingham and communities like it to maybe be uh, uh, come a part of the Birmingham Earth Coalition. And um, you can just email me if you'd like to do that. Thank you, Nina. And then Nancy Muse mentioned she has a question for Cindy. Nancy, can you unmute and ask your question?
Nancy? Can you hear me? Can, yes, we can now. I'm sorry, I had an incoming call that sort of blocked everything out. Yes, uh, Cindy, now this is not up to date, but years ago, there uh, there was a NRC meeting, which um, has, you know, happened, I would say, from time to time on, there was really no um, regularly set public scoping, but when, you know, from time to time when they were making changes at Brands Ferry, they had to include public comment, as you know. But something that's concerning is I, you know, I know Tennessee Riverkeeper is keeping up with microplastics and other pollution, but I don't really know of any group now who's serving as a watchdog for the Browns Ferry plant because the, um, I believe it's called entrainment when the water circulates around the reactor building, at the, to, inside the reactor building to cool the the, the, you know, internal, um, uh, I'm sorry, I went blank, uh, the, the, cool, the yeah. coolant, the, thank you, yeah. uh, but anyway, so when it's re it goes around, and it, it's released back into the river, I mean, there have been violations over the years, where radioactive water was dumped, and it, there was a whistleblower that brought that to attention, and, and went through a horrible process, with a settlement with TVA because she was, of course, uh, not wanted there anymore. And she spent a few years, you know, trying to get a settlement because she blew the whistle. But it wasn't just that. There have been other incidences where there are low levels of radioactivity, even on a routine basis. And of course, they say, well, um, this is acceptable. It's no harm. There's no harm. But of course, it's all cumulative. Um, and I just wonder, is there, is there anybody now watchdogging Brown's Ferry? Well, so yeah, I mean, normally the Riverkeeper would, would be who we would turn to first for issues on a specific watershed, but David is covering a large territory, um, uh, Tennessee Riverkeeper is covering a large territory, I know they have a lot on their plate. So if we have to kind of, as a statewide group with limited capacity, we have to kind of rely on people on the ground like you to tell us something like that might be going on that we need to look into. And I would imagine Sierra Club might even be interested in that. So, and you're, I know you're Sierra Club person, Nancy. So if you'll just email me, maybe we can get on, we, maybe we can have a conversation um, in more detail about just, just checking into that. It just has, it hadn't been brought to our attention, but we're, we're happy to look into it and see if there's something that we need to do. Well, great. Because I, I know that um, it's, I mean, no, if there's such a higher population density around Birmingham, Montgomery, and I think a lot of, you know, and there's a lot of issues down there y'all have to pay attention to, but I do feel that way up here, we're like in another, almost another kingdom up here. And we, we do need more attention on Brown's Ferry up here. Um, right. and we'll, we'll definitely be in touch because I, yeah, okay. we're supposed to keep an eye on the areas that aren't as well covered as Birmingham. So the Mobile and some of those, those areas that have a lot more groups. So we're, we're happy to, to get in touch and, and, talk a little more about that in detail. Thank you. Thank you. There is a, a volunteer form that Nina has put into the chat box for those. Uh, there was a question about volunteering with gas. And so for, for those in the Birmingham area that are interested in that, please look at that sign up form. Um, we are now a few minutes past seven. Um, are there burning questions that we need to ask before we sign off for the evening? Dana, there was one more in the chat that I did want to answer real quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. There's, it's, what's the next opportunity for, for people to get involved in advocating for the state water plan? And I, did, I don't guess I really made it very clear, but because the current governor is not as interested in, lead, in leading on this, and that we want to get the legislative committee meeting again um, that was meeting before and see uh, get them up to speed on the work that was done under Governor Bentley and, and see where we can go next. We were trying to do that last year. We have some legislators that are interested in, in reinvigorating that committee, but they um, COVID hit and that kind of stalled us on that. But we're hoping to get that committee back together. So once we are ready for that, we will, um, if you're following us on, on, on our 
website or email list that we will put out the names of those particular legislators that are on that committee and get, get folks calling them and getting involved. So that'll be, and then with the, the next election, who knows what will happen in 2022, all the things could change. So <laughs> we'll keep adjusting our strategy as needed. Well, I hope the speakers are having time to see all the praise heaped on you in the chat box. Um, uh, this has been a fabulous meeting. I am very, very grateful to the three of you for joining us and for the interest in the group as a whole. Um, we will um, send out the slides and um, which will contain again, contact information for any of our three speakers. I do want to say again, like I said at the top of the hour, that um, our program in March will be about um, homelessness in our community and will be joined by One Roof, um, the Firehouse Shelter and Pathways. So more to, about that later, it's March 18th. Thanks everybody um, very much for tonight. Great meeting, see you later. <laughs>